Let's see if this works. Mm. Okay, great. Um, I love her voice. It's awesome. So thank you, everyone, for joining our first DFA alumni webinar. We're so excited and honored to have um, John Kane with us, who is not only a great DFA advocate and a brilliant mind, uh, who's a visiting professor at um, IIT, but also is a part of the DeFamily. family. Literally, his daughter is on the one of the New York ambassadors and was part of DFA for her um, experience in college. So we're very excited that he will be joining us to discuss measuring impact um, and give you his insight into how do you find define success in design. Uh, but before I pass to uh, John, just want to say a brief word to all of you. Um, this webinar is coming to you from the DFA Alumni Board. We are a newly started group and we're really hoping to engage alumni in new ways from coaching, connecting, and contributing pillars that we will tell you guys more about. But the key thing is really we want to help connect other alumni to great opportunities local to their cities, help connect to each other, help connect to professionals in the field of design. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm repping my DFA swag. Uh, DFA is always at the heart of everything I do. So I'm very excited that um, we have, have you all on this call. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to John. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, um, feel free to put some text in the chat. Um, and then if you do need to say something as well, make sure to unmute yourself. The button is on the bottom left um, of your screen. So thanks again for joining. John, um, take it away. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Um, big fan of DFA, um, as Andrew mentioned. Um, <clears throat> I was originally introduced to DFA through uh, my daughter, Isabella, who was at Rensselaer Polytechnic, and uh, I didn't know about DFA. Um, hi, Chala. Um, <laughs> there you are. Um, I'm old enough to uh, have been a part of other design organizations like American Center for Design. I was a board member. I'm involved in the future planning of the American Institute of Graphic Arts right now, and these uh, professional organizations and associations grew out of the Guild Age because design itself grew out of the art and craft tradition and through the Industrial Age and up to the post-war era, the professional groups and the professional associations and, and communities around it uh, were, were, were of that sort that I just mentioned. I'm really intrigued by, just a shout out to DFA, um, I really do understand it as the next wave of practitioners and the next wave of designers, um, <clears throat> especially as we think about design and all the way that it's practiced, not just by people that have degrees in it, but by allied fields, adjacent fields, other disciplines. Um, everybody seems to have gotten the design religion. And I was telling Liz and Rebecca and some others that I really feel for my money that DFA is the new center of the practice because it's so strongly tied to this group. Um, when I said, I think you got an interesting problem on your hands, which is you need to, as the students and the studio base <clears throat> that's anchored into schools grows up and grows out into practice, they're gonna wanna remain connected. And so you're gonna have to extend into the uh, kind of professionalization of design um, and and because people are going to want to stay connected to this, and that's an awesome problem to have. Um, so I'm all over the mission, um, and I love the um, one thing I'll just before we launch in here. Um, I love the way in which design now has a values-based component to it. Um, when I grew up in the field and got started, it didn't have such a values-based aspect to it, but it's important to all of you that the work you're doing is important, um, that it's good in a sense, and that's what we're gonna touch on today um, in the slides that I've put together and the exercise. So hopefully um, through email distribution, you've had a chance to get the slides, uh, the slide, the assignment that I handed out, um, and I thought we could do a little bit of live open the microphone kind of readout um, as we get towards the end. 
Um, we did talk with Jarek and Andrew that I'm going to do some upfront um, yakking here, uh, and then we're going to get into the exercise where we'll open the mic and have some of you share out. Um, and it's not lost on us that we thought, hmm, maybe you, <laughs> having heard the upfront spiel that I'm going to go through, you wish you may have had that before you launched in the assignment, but I don't think there's going to be an issue with that. Make sense? Awesome. Good to go? Great. Thanks, John. And I'm going to ping um, the document out to the WebEx as well for any of those who want to look at the assignment as John is um, speaking. Okay. Go All right. So I'm going to go into screen share mode because we gave this a shot uh, before the call started. And let me know if you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is a full screen measure the impact of design for social challenge. Perfect. We're good. Okay. Hey, class. Um, so one of the things I'm doing right now, in addition to some consulting that's always a part of my life, is I'm a visiting professor at the Institute of Design at IIT. I wrap up there in May. Um, and at IIT and the Institute of Design, I've been helping them develop some new course work and new course curriculum around uh, the intersection of design technology and ethics. So I'm very, very passionate about this topic. Um, I'm both by no means a dyed in the wool expert uh, around ethics, but I'm very fascinated about the ways in which we have to redirect design attention to shape a more, what I like to call wise, fair, just and equitable future. So, um, Keep some questions going in the chat window and maybe I'll take a little break in about five or six minutes and kind of see where we're at and we can calibrate from there. But I'm, I've probably got about 12 or so. I'll kind of try to do these slides in two chunks. So here's what was advertised to you all. Uh, and Andrew, please feel free in between me taking breaths to say, hey, John, slow down or there's a question. Well done, thanks. So I've highlighted some of the words that you see here. Uh, that was advertised in Why You're Showing Up Today. Great tool for tackling social challenges, but how do we measure impact? For me, I love the way that that was framed because how do we know we're making progress um, on the work that we're doing and the solutions that we're creating if we can't have a way of measuring it? And I'd even go so far as to throw in here an old business aphorism, an old business saying that says you can't manage what you can't measure. And a little bit of an overstatement, but if you can't find some way to get underneath it and understand it, which is to say measure it in a way, we don't know how to size up the challenge that we're against. And it's not only in the front end of design that we can think about that, but also after we've, after the intervention, after the launch, after the creative act, um, how can we understand the impact of our creations, right? So how do we uh, design and measure for success? I love the highlighting of social challenge, and that's kind of where I thought we'd start here. Um, I'll try to go a little bit slow in case anybody wants to unmute and jump in. I love this question. It's all kinds of fill in the blank design going on right now. Uh, futures design, um, UX, UI design, experience design, service design, social innovation, social design, right? And I've started with this question around what is a social challenge and how do we think about that? One of the people, that we draw from <clears throat> scholars in one of my classes, Arturo Escobar says this really neat thing, the potential of design to contribute to the profound cultural and ecological transitions of today, right? Face effectively the interrelated crises of climate, food, energy, poverty, and meaning. Love it, absolutely love it, super passionate about it. Um, I've got a slide, I think, at the very end of the deck with uh, a list of readings if you want to follow up on any of those things. But I read a lot of this kind of stuff, too. In a class I'm doing, a master's class I'm doing right now, we read from a lot of this kind of stuff that comes from a whole variety of different mainstream media, scholarship. And <clears throat> I picked this one because I thought it was a pretty good example. I believe my time at Reddit, <clears throat> I'm a big Redditor, 
made the world a worse place, says this guy with his hold fast tattoos. I don't happen to know Dan McComas, but I kind of like this challenge. And in the class that I'm doing, I challenge students to think about the difference between good problems, ones that we can all, <clears throat> excuse me, agree upon as worthy challenges to solve, water in water scarce areas, food insecurity, um, education, energy, climate change, flat earthers. These are all interesting and good challenges to solve, but quite often in the context of education or maybe even doing our own work, um, I think we sometimes get let off the hook of challenging how we work and how we design by just saying that we're trying to tackle food insecurity or crime or climate change. We don't really know if we're measuring against the effectiveness of the design because it kind of gets hidden behind the broader problem of, wow, this is a really great challenge to solve. And for me, in the classes that I'm working on right now, I like the stuff, I like thinking about a way to construe social challenge and social good as how some of these problems show up in social media platforms, in our digital devices, in our behaviors, and in our expectations. And I've got just a few here. So we're all pretty aware of the way in which social discourse is now compromised by social media platforms. It's corrupted. Twitter even says this. Facebook says this. Um, many, many people talk about how, the ways in which our digital devices monopolize our time and our attention and our gaze. Um, love to watch those videos on Reddit of the person falling down the open manhole because they're gazing at their cell phone as they walk along. Right? Um, yeah. It's hilarious. So I like to say this, and I know this is a little bit long, but I'll just talk through it real quickly, that the broader ones here, if I back up a slide, food insecurity and health and well-being and that kind of stuff is what this brilliant person that came along 60, 70 years ago, Horst Riddle, said wicked problems. And what he meant by wicked problems was a class of challenge um, that's beyond the just sort of proximity of what we can do in a day or a week or a month. Wicked problems also come, are ill-defined. Um, moreover, we can't even agree on the nature of the problem, right? And if we can't even agree on the nature of the problem, there's no way we're gonna to get to some agreement about the nature of how we might go about solving it, right? In other words, as I write here in the second bullet point, massively complex, right? Love Daniel Wall and the way he says, they acknowledge the complex interdependence of multiple stakeholders and are not simple linear cause and effect things, right? So it gets me thinking. That gets me thinking that, hmm, I'm sorry to say it, and I, this comes from a, from a card-carrying design person, me, I don't know if design alone can solve that problem. And this is where I love, again, shout out to DFA, how the way that it cuts across so many different disciplinary perspectives and domains. We're going to have to get multiple perspectives, not because we want to hold hands, but complex problems are going to mean that we're going to need integrated teams comprised of many different domains and perspectives in order to solve them, right? So for my money and what I want to talk about in this exercise and in the webinar today is that one pathway to solving these giant intractable wicked problems that Horst Riddle talks about, the ones on the left, is that you can figure out ways to address them and attack them through the things on the right hand side. I really do believe that. I really think my 91 year old mother who calls Apple computer every time words with friends or Scrabble goes down has no conception about how data works, has no conception about this complex ecosystem of products and services. And I think that's kind of a social challenge. I think we have to educate and evolve um, publics towards a better understanding of where is my data, what are my rights, how can I act within these complex systems, right? So to put a little bit of a finer point on it, actually before I launch in there, any quick thoughts or questions? I'll roll on. Team, if you have questions, feel free to unmute or type in the chat and I'm happy to read them out. Here we go. 
So this is a little bit of a precursor of what I call the ledger exercise, which is the assignment handed out before today. <clears throat> so one day I was complaining to my spouse about the fact that I quit Facebook and I was proud of myself. And she said, well, I don't know. We get to see what our daughters are up to. And I've been able to find old friends that I never otherwise would have gotten in touch with. And I thought, all right, I got to calm down. It is actually pretty awesome in a lot of ways. But, right, <clears throat> and this is taken from this guy, Chamanth, who is one of the founder VCs of Facebook. He says here, I think in the deep recesses of our minds, we kind of knew something bad could happen, right? And he says here in the second paragraph, we're creating tools that are ripping apart social fabric. So there's something here on both the good and the bad side, right? We take the example of ubiquitous devices. Pretty awesome. Everybody on this call probably has a tablet or a, and or a phone and or a laptop or and or a work issued one of these things. They're ubiquitous. They're pervasive. They're all around us. Um, taking a quick quote here from Tony Fidel, who was the lead of iPod and then went on to found Nest, he says, hmm, you know, this is taken from a Wired article that's called, and it's titled something like, I think I have it in the, in the list in the back, I wake up in the night in cold sweats wondering what have I done? Kind of like Dan McComas. He's asking this question about, holy crap, we've been designing for ourselves for so long people in their 20s, value systems of those that live in Silicon Valley are trying to take their problem to be the center of the, you know, their center of the world to be the problem and begin to design from there. I think that's kind of a problem. Moving on to the cool, awesome, ubiquitous nature of being able to take photos anytime, anywhere. On the left-hand side in 2008, here's a picture of the announcement of the Pope. And here's the, from the exact same angle and with the announcement of the election of Pope Francis in the lower left in 2013. And you can see this stunning way in which the ubiquity of devices and cameras have come into just everyday experience, right? And in, in the way we go about our day. And here on the right-hand side, whether you're a Catholic or not, I don't care. Um, it's just a signal, right? It's Pope Francis, whether you're aligned to him and the church or not, it is a signal of one person, an important person in that community saying, hey, put the phones down, um, focus over here, right? Kind of snapping his fingers saying, we need to um, reorder what's important in our life and perhaps devices have gone a little bit too far. I just got my 23andMe results back today, which is pretty cool and I'm going through that right now, looking at how much Neanderthal I have in my blood system running, coursing through it and there's actually some there. And What's neat about this kind of the way in which medicine and what we can know about the world is changing things is it is quite literally going to change the way medicine is practiced, the way healthcare is given, the way we live our lives, our expectations about our lives. I learned about some gene predispositions I have today to certain kinds of cancers, right? It's going to be freaking cool. But on the other side of the ledger, um, just like we have Equifax data breaches and credit card data breaches, what about all that data running around out there? And moreover, there's other kinds of problems. For example, I happen to know that 23andMe's business model is that they're syndicating, they're aggregating that data and selling it. But I have no economic stake in that world. They do because they can aggregate it, but I can't aggregate it. So here again, no matter what kind of example or what kind of digital techno-centric way of living we might want to bring up, I think there's a way to see both the good in it and possibly the bad. And this perspective comes from this brilliant woman, Judy Wiseman. She's in the reading list in the back. Highly recommend you getting in touch with her work. Pressed for Time is her latest book. It's brilliant. And she says this cool thing. She says that, you know, we're only getting the selection of technologies we're getting because of, of who's designing it. We shouldn't leave a bunch of engineers in charge of defining the future because technologies are crystallizations of society. We live in the futures that engineers are helping to build. 
And I would add, as I do in my design class in a design school in front of design people, say, well, we shouldn't just leave it to, leave it to designers either. And that usually gets some kind of gasp going. But her point isn't, it's not shame on engineers or shame on designers. It's like there can't be a dis one single disciplinary perspective from which we start to build these things. So with that said, let me begin to turn into the way in which I think we might, as I said in the beginning, redirect design activity. So here's my observation, and this is like vastly oversimplified, so just bear with me, but I'd argue that there's a whole lot of stuff out there, UI, interaction design, and I've lived through these worlds, a kind of context of using something, interacting with something directly. And I call that the context of design for interaction, right? And we get RFPs for that, and I see design briefs written for that. And we all know, because we're smart folks on this call that have been recently through design school, and have been exposed to the ideas of service design and experience design that we need to look at into the broader context of where and how and when these things are used. This is why things like customer journey models are really useful. They help us understand the broader context in the, between the intersection of people and stuff in the world. But I wanna go one step further. And I think the idea of social challenge really lives in this third realm. And here I have, <clears throat> a list of global smartphone penetration. I'm looking at it through my bifocals because I'm old. And I've grabbed this off the web from this site called On Device. I don't even know who that is. But if you notice, like global smartphone penetration, Singapore, 85, somewhere around 13 or 14, the USA shows up at 57%. I started thinking, Huh, you know how easy it is for all of us to just assume that everybody's got a smartphone and how that isn't actually true. You can see it here in this map. And then I thought, well, isn't it interesting that they only list 47 countries and there's actually a hell of a lot more of that uh, than that in the, on the planet. And this underscores my point that <clears throat> quite often the design brief is specced and written for, whether you want to call it the RFP or the brief, it's specced and written for a kind of assumed set of problems. And I really think that the way we might strengthen our design, the, why, the way we might start to attack some of these underlying social challenges is by considering an additional context here. And that's the one that I call the social cultural context. Question then is, of course, how do we do that? Um, I also get a question sometimes of like, yeah, well, I don't have the license to go outside to that third bound, but I want to challenge everybody on this call to actually be resistance fighters, to be a kind of new force in um, bringing something new into the context of your work. What I think hangs in the balance is this. This is, um, if any of you are familiar with the one laptop per child, the OLPC that came out of MIT, and many famous backers connected with it. And their idea, much like notions of so-called technology transfer post-World War II, was to give these laptops to everybody. But if you go into the countries in which they were dropped, you see that these PCs are actually doorstops, they are weights to hold things down, because there's no infrastructure there. And it's not even an infrastructure problem. It's a problem of what are the most, what are the most, what are the biggest challenges to solve in these contexts? And PCs didn't meet that challenge. It was assumed by the Westerners that everybody else, this would be a preeminent um, need for these cultures. And it turns out not to be true. So it's pretty heavy, pretty weighty. Uh, there's a lot on our shoulders if we start thinking this way, and we may never get anywhere. We may even say that these are intractable problems to think beyond, as I, as I say here, this third scale into the social cultural context and how you might include that in your design. But there's hope, people. Um, on the left-hand side, this is sort of like the ledger again. There's a letter written in January 2018 from the largest teacher union uh, in the U.S., in California, um, saying, please disentangle our children from your damn phones. Please do something about that. And on the right-hand side, I've got a couple of examples. You probably all see your weekly report now. Maybe you're not looking at it, but you know it's available, right? 
How do we better manage screen time? It's possible to do this stuff. These are, by the way, if you're watching, listening along for the word measurement to show up, think about that on the right-hand side here. Think about your weekly report. It's all measurements. Uh, Google recently came out with a set of principles. They want to address the social challenges baked into the products and services that they make. Twitter, on the left-hand side, a Fast Company article asking the musical question, what would a healthy Twitter look like? On the right-hand side, um, news that Twitter is increasing transparency on the platform, and they're actually interested in, on this slide, measuring the health of the discourse on their platform. That gets me excited because it's got the word measurement. It's, it's about social health and it's about something that we encounter every day. Shared attention, shared reality, variety, receptivity. I have some friends at Twitter. I don't know how well they're getting down the road with this, but I think it's a signal that it's possible to do this kind of work in the context of the things we're Challenge today. Yeah, Siri's asking me questions. Um, Facebook, yes, questions? Um, I actually do have a quick question um, from the Google one that you brought up in particular. Um, this idea of AI, um, particularly in the enterprise space, when you think about ethics, mm -hmm. um, the idea of AI can benefit from a cost takeout perspective. Um, and reduce, but at the same time, it reduces headcount. So I guess mm -hmm. my question revolves around how do you balance or figure out what is the right measurement for good social design? Um, and maybe it's not even social design, but how do you make sure to balance the different metrics of like cost savings versus creating a healthy employee environment? Great question and a very tricky question. Um, and it ain't easy, unfortunately. For me, it begins with knowing, being able to think through the impacts of our decisions while we're designing these systems. It's okay to make a decision as long as we're aware that job creation and job loss might be at risk. Um, <clears throat> but it, I think it's kind of a crime to go through the motions of doing design work without first considering that as a question. As long as we can consider it as right. a question, we might be able to act, right? But if we're not even considering it, then we'll never be able to act. And that's a little bit of the point I made a couple minutes ago, right? But right. great, great question. Yeah, that's that whole concept of you can't manage what you can't measure. So if you're asking the right question, I guess, from the start, that's a good way to, to balance the, yeah. the different problems. So, um, yeah. let me move on here. Um, I think you get the point, right? It's possible to start acting in this way. So I think it's kind of like this. Here's like just your standard sort of design process. You can just glance at it for two seconds here. Plan it, understand context of use, specify requirements. This isn't my model, it's from somebody else. And I think that, you know, what I'm saying here is that success is conventionally understood relative to the way that this whole apparatus is built, if you follow what I'm saying. And one of Isabella's professors at RPI, a guy that I'll read any damn thing that guy puts out, is he says here, we've lost the ability to link the broader sort of conditions of humanity and well-being, right, to the work that we're doing every day. He says the question just never seems to come up. And he asks, he puts this to us, how can we live gracefully and with justice? Right. It just what he's saying is it never comes up in this context because this is the design brief. This is the design challenge. So I think we got to stick it in here. I think we got to stick a broader sense of what success might mean into the work that we're doing. And I think it might just be that simple. Are clients always going to buy it? No. Are you going to win on every single project? No. But I think if, unless to Andrew's question, we start considering the downstream consequences, we'll never get to the point where we can start addressing them. So, um, do you want to talk about this? No, not yet. <clears throat> so this is what was handed out. I don't know if there are any brave souls on the call that might want to unmute and talk a little bit about this, but I'll set it up here for two seconds, no being clear on time. Expand the design process to include issues and stakeholders outside of the brief. 
Think of the little diagram I just gave. Expand, expand, sorry, expansive our notions. Expand our notions of what, who is the stakeholder, not just uh, the folks that the target audiences maybe spelled out in the brief, but other folks not represented in the system. And then how do we remain connected? In other words, to me, this is like a question of reverse engineering. All those examples I just went through, Facebook, Twitter, Lightphone, Google. What if, what if we began the other way around? What if, right, we knew back then when they started what we know now, would we have designed differently, right? This is the example of that. How much of your day goes onto Facebook or is connected to your um, iPhone? Mine's an embarrassingly huge amount. So here's what I ask you to do. Pick a digital service, could be anything, don't care, 23andMe. Use this ledger template to create, as I've got here, a set of pluses and a, and a list of minuses. Can be low tech, right? The benefits and then the minuses. Those, this is the key part. Be able to think through in advance and real quickly. This isn't months of study. Real quickly, the unforeseen, unexpected, unintended consequences or, or challenges, right? And then I think it's just a matter of good old design thinking, good old service design. It's like move into how might we mode, focus on the right hand list, pick one thing and see if we can address it. So I gave you all this example of this real app called ResApp. You cough into it, zaps your cough off to a database uh, of pre-recorded coughs and just does a little comparative analysis through an algorithm. And it says, oh, you've got cancer, right? Doesn't actually diagnose cancer. It's supposed to just be like coffee related things. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of see here in the ledger, it's like, hey, this is cool. At the level of like pushing some buttons and a pizza shows up at your door, it's like you can cough into this thing and there's like a Shazam that says, huh, you might have asthma, right? That's pretty cool at the level of interaction. And here's my, th here's my model of three scales. And the level of, at the level of context, right? Direct to consumer, you don't have to run out of your house to the doctor, that's pretty cool. That's actually cool, not cynical. At the level of impact to humanity, holy crap, a cost database, I don't know what kind of crazy doctor might make use of that, but you gotta think that more medical knowledge is better. And then of course, on the right-hand side, it's like you can just pick off one or two of these things. And what I'm asking you to do, whoever wants to now unmute, is like number three, Pick one of the things on the right-hand side, and could you tell me a way you might incorporate that into the design brief, and how might you measure it? So let me go back into, I think you're all still viewing my screen. Did anybody take on this assignment, or do you want to think about it live and in person? Um, ready, go. So unmute if anyone has something they'd like to discuss. If not, I, I recommend we take five minutes to think about it and then address it as a team. So, but does anyone want to share? Whoever shares gets a DFA t-shirt sent to them. Oh, yes. We could also work off a res app here if, if we want to just get a little banter going. It's like we could pick anything in the minus column and do a little design brainstorming about whether or not we might be able to incorporate that requirement in design. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I can, just like Michelle, I can add something. Um, so I was looking at Google Maps. Um, cool. and when I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, today I was looking at Google Maps. Um, and I did the exercise with Google Maps. Um, and there was a news story that was coming out today um, about uh, Taiwan and they had some Google images uh, for Google Earth that was uploaded and it showed their military bases. And there was a bunch of articles about how it is compromising their national security. Hmm. That's really interesting. Really interesting. So is that a uh, uh, a bug or a feature? Um, it was <laughs> Google Earth doesn't, I guess, talk with the government completely about um, what areas they're going to cover. Um, and uh, there are certain areas that the government has said, no, you're not allowed to publish photos of, but this area was not on that short list. 
Um, right. So it's showing their missiles. And you can see the pictures of their missiles. Wow, this one's really multi-layered. It's awesome. It's um, an unintended consequence of the creation of this system. Um, this probably got some pretty bad consequences for the people that don't want that revealed, but for the people that want that information, and here we get to the context, right, again, setting, um, it's probably pretty interesting, right? So, Lexi, if we take the fact that this might have an unintended consequence, um, is a solution just more and better filters and controls? Or do we take the consequence as um, this information should be made available to whoever wants it? Did you have a perspective on that? Companies are not, Google did not work um, with the government. And I think that's a loaded statement, but from the picture, you can clearly see that it's a missile. And I'm, I'm surprised that someone on the Google team did not think through the consequences or the actions of putting up pictures of missiles. Right. Nice. And that's merely the trick of this exercise. Was there another? That's, a, that's an interesting point, too, because then that brings into a larger question of, okay, this level three social, cultural, environmental, as private companies are creating these applications and services for the public, how do they take into consideration the balance of working with the government? And also, how do they take into consideration whether they have to conform to certain um, requirements or government um, needs to not affect, not to like alter, alter or drastically change like cultural or environmental issues. So this example per se. So for some people, it'll be beneficial to see that the missiles are there because then they can prepare. But for that government, it's very counterintuitive. How about so something at a smaller scale? Did anybody think about like a Nest thermostat or an Apple Watch? This might be smaller scale. Um, this is Andrew. Um, I was, can you guys hear me? Yep, I got you. Okay, um, I yep. was thinking about um, uh, online banking and mobile banking apps, um, which have that, um, you know, smaller scale direct interaction um, and don't generally have the obvious um, so, uh, socio-political um, context that Lexi brought up. Um, but I, one thing that I thought was really interesting, certainly there are the broader socio-cultural um, things, but I thought something that was really interesting is how the presence of a, um, a banking app on my phone might mean that uh, that device is no longer a source of relaxation or something if I'm concerned about finances mm -hmm. and how it might um, introduce more, a higher level of financial anxiety into the lives of the people who have mm. that always accessible convenience. Mm. Nice. So definitely a question that we would put on the right-hand side of the ledger. Right. It sounds, Andrew, like it's not at the level of specific, you know, font choice, font right. size interaction. It sounds a little bit like somewhere between the purpose um, of the system and something at the level of social cultural, um, you make yeah. a really nice point that I think parallels why, let me just back up here to this one. You know, with more information comes this like interesting mm, behavioral change of something we can or ultimately need to check minute by minute, second by second. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, t Snapchat, tweets, you name it. Um, just that little behavior of next time you're in an elevator with somebody, do this little trick, pull your phone out when you're by yourself and watch then within a few seconds, how many other people pull their phone out and stare at their phone. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, this just, this kind of habitualized, uh, checking in with these things, I would absolutely claim 
like Andrew, that this would be- belong on the right hand side. And I think that's a little bit behind maybe what these kinds of like, so how much time did you spend on your iPhone or on Facebook today, right? Other thoughts there, Andrew? I don't think so. Okay. I like that one. I'm sorry. This is Izzy. I was going to say, isn't there like a benefit to having all of that knowledge at your fingertips, though? Yes. And with this banking app, like you can detect if your credit card was stolen or someone has hacked your bank account within like seconds of it happening. Yes. Like, with this power Agreed. comes responsibility and like a lot of benefits, but also a lot of, you know, minuses as well. Nice. Very nice. There's a lot. Isabel is pointing to the left hand side of the ledger. We can't just say, let's not do these things. There's the um, Hippocratic Oath in medicine, do no harm. And there's a really interesting, uh, if you've ever read uh, Latour's Love Your Monsters, it's in the list, in the, the reading list. Yeah. Um, he, he grapples with how we as designers might think about uh, the precautionary principle. Should we just not do this stuff? And this is where my, I think the ledger exercise is very helpful. It's like, no, we shouldn't avoid action here, but we should have some simple back of the envelope ways of thinking through unintended consequences. Good point. Other folks who may have done this or want to use ResApp as the example. Izzy, do you want to bring up your example that you just posted in? It's an interesting one. Yeah, one. Um, I was actually talking about this with um, um, my friends at work because we do this article club and we are talking about the pluses and minuses of this really cool technology that we have now. And one of the things that we were talking about was 23andMe, and one of my friends brought up that 23andMe actually caught a serial killer who was large 20, 30 years, a couple decades ago, but 23andMe was able to compare the data in its database um, to things, data that cops or, um, I don't know, some authorities had it, um, and so they compared it to the 23andMe data and found a family member and then like tracked this family members members and just like a whole circle of tracking people down um, yeah. through data connections. But 23andMe caught a serial killer. So a plus to society because now that person's locked up. But it's also kind of creepy because there's so much data floating out there about all of us. And, you know, can anyone have access to it? Should it just be cops? Should cops not have access to this? It's kind of a whole debate about what should be regulated. That's an awesome one. Um, because it seems having just gone through 23andMe today, um, there's sort of the right to my own privacy. But if my contributing my, the point Isabella's is making here that's really thorny, is if my DNA data leads to an adjacent family member that didn't have any rights in the system to either be forgotten or not known, that becomes a really, you, you see the way in which these technologies bring us together in a web uh, in quite a, a, a different way than we have before. Um, and there's so much discussion right now about the right to be forgotten that comes along with the notions of privacy. Um, that aren't just individual at the individual level, but at the social level. Um, I, uh, this is Rob. I do think for that story, it's interesting, uh, 23andMe uh, and Ancestry.com, that wasn't, it, it wasn't coming from 23andMe, it was coming from an open source data mm. um, base, DNA database that's used by researchers a lot um, mm. for that. Uh, I think 23andMe tends to take the sort of Facebook stance that we protect yeah. data yeah, we unless it's legally required for us to do, uh, which may or may not be true. Um, but it is also interesting thinking about the implications of some of that and like could 23andMe be um, compelled to release data? I think within the context of the serial killer, you know, on the, the pros, side you get the serial killer on the con side you get the person who um, maybe has been hanging around on a street corner for a little too long and people are annoyed by that but like you know is is the extreme example of good publicity we call a serial killer um, enough to go for like bad examples of this being used in less 
desirable ways. Yes. Can you, you can all see my screen here. I'm, I'm sharing a homework yeah. assignment, right? So I had an ethicist come into class, um, and this is actually somebody from a divinity school. Uh, I learned late in my life that a lot of big time, if you want to go get a serious degree in philosophy, you might go to a divinity school or, a, or become a theologian. Anyway, <clears throat> his name is Grattan Brown, and he came into my class and gave a talk, and he talked about this very simple model that I will include in the slides. If any of you want the slides, I'll send them to Andrew and Jarek, and you can get in touch with him. And I'll include this simple model. He talked about action, intent, and circumstance, to which I added outcome. And in the context of our discussion today, you can think about not only the immediate outcome and near term, but we also need to cast an eye towards the longer term unintended consequences. And then I said in class, this part, let me just scroll down. If you can see this, it's a little small. But I said, this kind of dynamic works out, plays itself out across a number of different frames. So I use the example here in the writing to talk about nuclear energy. There was an author, a designer of the capability of nuclear energy that then can be used by enterprises, governments, companies, right, or even by the public to, to the ends of good or bad. And you can't really say thusly that nuclear energy is on the whole bad because its designers and authors, right, like Enrico Fermi, are much lauded for the creation of these things. That's their frame. Their frame, their action and their intent and their circumstance was pure science. But you can take these technologies, 23andMe, and you can put them in the hands of publics or you can put them in the hands of enterprises that may have very different intentions, right? Towards very different kinds of outcomes, either intended or unintended. And when I say the ethical question in the context of design is a very multi-layered rich question, this is exactly what I'm getting at. Because you don't control as designers, right? What publics can do with guns or television or books, right? Or even other actors like enterprises. So very good point made there, appreciate that. And I'll include that little model <clears throat> here at the end uh, of these slides. Great. Other examples from other folks. So, um, I have one. I'm sorry? I have one. Uh, yeah. I got Vincent. Um, I was talking a lot lately with some friends about social media. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. No, I <laughs> haven't seen you since last summer. Yeah. I think the last time I saw you, you were giving this talk, and uh, I'm excited to dive back into it. Please. What's your question? What's your thought? So um, on, we were talking about social media, and one of the conclusions that I've kind of came to um, when it came to, like, talking about all the, like, minuses, um, with a lot of the social media apps, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, it seems to me that it's because of their business models, like mm. the, just like the design of the business model where it's like ad targeting. And in order to maximize profits, you're maximizing how well and how many ads you can target. Nice. And therefore more information is being collected um, and you're incentivizing more people to spend more time on the sites. And so it almost seems to me, and I'm wondering how things like that fit into this. Like yeah. um, if you can kind of come up with a, a takeaway like that, where it's like, wait a minute, all these unintended consequences are because of the design of like the profit um, scheme or the business model. Yes. Nice. I won't um, go into my browser and start searching at the moment. This came up in class last week and I used the example of uh, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter. He recently <clears throat> gave his readout to Wall Street, their public company. And if you just Google Dorsey in Wall Street 2019, or maybe it's his Q4, or, you know, we're just in the middle of Q1 here still. Um, he said something interesting. Uh, he said, well, the guidance to Wall Street was going to be a little bit lower or flat or maybe even down. And he said, because we're going to have to invent, invest. Millions and millions, 20 million, I think, is the number off the top of my head that was cited there in um, um, new tools, systems and processes that govern our platform. In other words, what he's saying is, 
hey, Wall Street, sorry, but we're not going to be as profitable because I got to dip into what otherwise would be passed through as profits to better manage the health of the discourse on our platform. Now, I'm not holding him up and lauding his, his capabilities, but you can see exactly Vince's point here in action, which is if the business model is predicated on advertising, and it is for Twitter and Google and Facebook by and large, then you're gonna have to suffer some consequences there. And you can see it playing out in the case of Jack Dorsey saying, shit, we're gonna have to eat some profit to right the ship here, because otherwise maybe the whole model is at risk, which I think is a really interesting point lurking behind Andrew's comment there, which is, you know, free is not free. Uh, there's a couple of really powerful statements out there, like if you don't know what the product is, it could be that you're the product, your time, your attention. That's what I love about these calls to disentangle us from our devices a little bit. I'm not saying they're evil, but we, when we are the product, right, we, we largely, publics don't have an economic stake in that game. And Andrew, or I'm sorry, Vince is making a great point. Maybe it's time also to revisit the business model by which we might bring new services out to market. Great point, Vince. Love that. Not really apparent here in this ledger exercise, but that's really awesome. Thank you. Other thoughts, questions? And if not, I know we're near at time here. Um, <clears throat> righto? So we'll go back into um, full view here. So I've been having master's students do this for a while now. And if you look at the right-hand column here, let's just take a few. Um, decrease in personal time with care givers, what happens to my data, that's a data security issue, right? If you bucket the kinds of problems, you'll see that these are the kinds of problems, right? Security and trust of data breaches, mo missing mental models for my 91-year-old mom about how this damn thing really works and to stop calling Cupertino every time her, her Scrabble or words with friends with my wife goes down. Right? These kinds of things, the ultimate unsustainability of our time and attention to stay connected to these devices, that's a kind of problem, right? So you can use this cheat sheet perhaps to help you think through. And for my money, if we could just pick out one on the right-hand side, I think we're doing humanity a huge service. A whole bunch of really great readings here. I love all of these. Uh, I'll be totally honest that it's through Isabella that a lot of the science and technology and society studies like Langdon Winner and others appear in here, Dean Newsma, um, really, really great stuff that has hugely influenced. I've got some links because I'm so passionate about this, about people that are trying to make inroads around social impact. And I'll just end with this really nice quote from this guy from Chicago, Victor Margolin, design historian. He says, Design is continually inventing its subject matter, what it's about, how it designs the problems it addresses. So it is not limited by outworn categories. The world expects new things from designers and that is the nature of design. Um, so I'm in the end, incredibly passionate about the potential for design. I think it needs a new active center. I believe that that's DFA. And I hope you guys keep doing these kinds of exercises. I'll just give one last point here. This thing that I showed you is actually part of an exercise that we go through. And it might be fun to come back in a future DFA alumni talk and run through the ethical question itself, not just how might we attack unforeseen unintended consequences, but look at the ethical questions themselves and how they might affect our design solutions. So that's what I have. We're at time now. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, John. Um, from the conversations uh, that I've been having on Slack and the conversations in the chat, it seems like everyone's so enthused about this topic. And I know personally it's allowed me to think about design in a new way and be more conscious about how whatever we are creating does have a larger impact. Um, and it's interesting to think about how you can incentivize people 
for uh, Vincent, Vincent's note, um, how you can incentivize people to change their business models or maybe um, adapt them so that they can impact social change as well. So yep. thank you for sharing all of your comments. Thank you to everyone also who participated um, and gave their ideas uh, to this conversation. Um, quick note is that if you do have any questions for John, um, feel free to contact him directly. His email was on the presentation. Um, and also feel free to contact the alumni board if you want to have that follow-up conversation that John mentioned um, or other topics that may interest you or want to get involved in DFA in another way. Um, John, I hope you're seeing all of the praises that are coming your way in the chat as well. Yes, thank, you all. thank you um, all. Thank you all. Ton of fun. Awesome. Okay, so I will, um, Andrew, just real quick, um, I, give me, um, I got to run off to dinner right now. Um, I'll add those little ethical framework questions to the end of the slideshow, send it to you uh, tomorrow. And any, anybody who wants the full slideshow, just uh, drop Andrew a note. Perfect. Thanks so much, team, and have a great weekend. Um, okay. We Thanks, all. Have a great Bye. weekend. Happy dinner. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.